गुड इवनिंग मैम मैम हैज ज्वाइंड आई बिलीव गुड इवनिंग मैम यस यस आई हैव ज्वाइंड गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग we are just uh, uh, waiting for professor asim siddiqui to join so that we can begin yeah
I believe everyone has joined. Good evening. Yeah, good evening, sir. Good evening. We'll just begin. Yeah, sure, sure. I'm here. Thank you. A very good evening to our esteemed delegates for the day. Professor Asim Siddiqui, Dr. Arnab Datta Roy, and Dr. Chuyun O, oh, respected principal of our college, Professor Kamla Devi, colleagues, and my dear students. As you all know, we have another session of enriching lectures today. We all are looking forward to an invigorating and soul nourishing session with our resource persons from different parts of the world. This reminds me of a few lines from Khalil Gibran's poem, Self Knowledge. For the soul walks upon all paths, the soul walks not upon a line, neither does it grow like a reed. The soul unfolds itself like a lotus of countless petals. With these words, may I now call upon the principal of our college, Professor Kamla Devi, to welcome our resource persons for the day. Madam, please. Yes, I hope I am audible. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely clear. Okay. A very good evening to all who have joined us today, uh, the second day of our international webinar. Yesterday we had Professor Asim Kumar Mukherjee, Professor Kian Pishkar and Professor Lakshmi Raj Sharma with us. Today we are going to listen Professor Muhammad Asim Siddiqui from Aligarh Muslim University, India, Dr. Arnav Datta Roy from Stockton University, New Jersey, and Dr. Chuyun O, San Diego State University, California, USA. Professor Muhammad Asim Siddiqui is a professor of English at Aligarh Muslim University, India. His area of interest include literary theory, Indian and Pakistani writings in English, cultural studies, film studies, etc. He has been on the editorial board of many prestigious literary and cultural journals and write, writes regularly in prestigious newspapers uh, like Hindu, India Today, Hindustan Times, uh, etc. He also appears in news channels like NDTV, uh, News Central 24 into 7 and many others. We are greatly honored by his gracious presence and warmly welcome him in this international webinar. Our second resource person and speaker for this session is Dr. Arnav Datta Roy, who is a visiting professor at Stockton University, New Jersey, USA. He has also been associated with University of Connecticut and Illinois State University. His current book project is Universalism in South Asian Literature, which is to analyze literary responses to colonialism in a range of modern works produced in Hindi, Bangla, and English. We most heartily welcome you, sir, for joining you. us in this international webinar. We have amongst us Dr. Chuyen O, Assistant Professor of Dance, School of Music and Dance, San Diego State University, California, USA. His area of study and research is performing art. 
he has done his phd from university of texas at austin in performing studies and published many uh, research papers in refereed journals on art and dance we are really very much obliged to these honored resource persons who in spite of their busy schedule and having vastly different time zones consented to come together to deliver lectures for the benefit of academic world a warm welcome to all our participants who have joined us today on youtube platform yesterday their questions and comments show that their quest for knowledge and enthusiasm towards exploring new dimensions of the world literature and art forms uh, hope you all will be immersed and be greatly benefited today by the deliberation of deliberations of our eminent scholars today a vast literature is being produced in every language of the world even in sanskrit which is no more a spoken language this literature consists of original writings and also translations print media and virtual media are e content so also other forms of art have a huge varieties and platforms thus they have crossed all barriers of time and space coming closer to all mankind but as i said yesterday this universalization is also affecting the originality and freshness of literature and art literature and art is basically individual centric individually generated culture specific being universal is a feature of science which is objective not subjective like literature and art i am sure we are going to have a great pleasure and enlightenment on these issues and many other important uh, issues and problems from our so learned speakers and in the end a very very warm welcome to all and we are very thankful to all of you for coming together and giving your precious time to us thank you thank you very much ma'am very very well said may i now request a very dynamic dr fatima nuri to summarize the lectures which were delivered yesterday by the venerated resource persons dr fatima thank you um a very pleasant evening to all of you uh, i know it's early morning in uh, uh, iowa right now where uh, um, anav is but uh, nonetheless pleasant evening to all of you uh, i dr fatima nuri assistant professor and convener department of english jagataran girls pg college university of allahabad would like to welcome our guests for the second day of the international webinar on contemporary world literature and art forms i'm here to render a brief summation of the events and talks of day 1 we started our webinar yesterday in the forenoon with the welcome of the chairperson our esteemed resource persons for the two days and other participants by the principal the chairperson professor asim mukherjee dean faculty of commerce university of allahabad and chairperson jagataran degree college governing body rendered a brief but a powerful note where he urged the young participants to bring back the storytelling traditions into their everyday lives the link between the ordinary living and cult literature according to professor mukherjee 
could be strengthened by the academicians and writers by focusing on the language and by deliberating classical writings into more accessible forms like television drama and plays a first resource person for the webinar professor kian peshkar vice president snt and head of the department of language and literature at the islamic azad university iran talked about i mckeven's narrative particularly his 2016 novel nutshell through the lens of object relations theory of the psychoanalysis melin uh, melin clean he commented on how mckeven's sardonic narrative is an example of the paradoxical society of the contemporary times and renders this shakespearean classical hamlet through the focal point of a fetus the narrative gives a glimpse of the psychological and the inner world of the character and ends in a rather shocking anxiety for the readers professor peshkar pointed out how mckeven as a writer works to make his readers aware of the society through a rendition of darker themes and controversial material professor lakshmi raj sharma former head of the department of english university of allahabad was a second speaker for the day one he addressed the issue of writing novels in india in in the english language which he feels involves much more machinations as it would in countries uh, of uh, in in european countries or in america or elsewhere the publishing industry the reading public the reading public control the kind of literary fiction that novelists are driven to write and professor sharma warns the writers and the publishers about the present age where novelists have to compete with filmmakers and other entertainment available on television and internet writing fiction today is a different ball game advocated professor sharma then that then what was in the case uh in the late 20th century or even in the first decade of the 21st century as the writers have to navigate through literary rackets and best sellers that are even bigger more vulgar and according to professor sharma more horribly efficient apart from the publishing industry environment literary taste women he stressed were in, in play a very important role in the fiction and it varies from time to time he talked about how english can be mingled with uh, local language to provide a native flavor to the readers fiction professor sharma remarked is the most democratic of forms as it mirrors the society we had a fabulous session yesterday with an advice to pay more heed to narrative storytelling and linguistic constructions we had two wonderful sessions about the art of publishing and the mechanics or mechanics of writing in professor sharma's lecture on writing english novel in india today and a most pertinent example of it uh elsewhere in the critical analysis that professor kian peshkar rendered in his talk melin uh, melin melin cleans perspective and object relations theory in i mckeven's nutshell but as the poet iqbal would have put it sitaro ke aage jahan aur bhi hai we promise an equally good if not a better if not better a session today our speakers for today are perhaps leaning as well as making a demand on us uh, listeners on the distinct sensibility that ren that relies not just on the written words but go a little beyond it to include other forms of expression narrative style in case of the ghazal and synthesis synthesizing and deliberating a dance form to analyze cultures and identities with us today is uh, dr chuyun o who would be joining us a little uh, in a while uh, assistant professor of dance theory and practice the school of music and dance san diego state university california dr anav datta roy author and research associate university of connecticut and of course professor asim siddiqui department of english aligarh muslim university 
who's the first speaker of the day. But before I introduce him, I would like to welcome the faculty members, researchers, and students of Jagataran Girls PG College, University of Allahabad, as well as uh, members from other various parts of the world right now. Uh, we, had in a, we had registrations from uh, uh, Korea and uh, uh, Middle East and Iran as well. Uh, various parts of the world who are connected with us right now through the YouTube live broadcast and Telegram chat group by the name of um, the chat group by the name of International Webinar on Contemporary World Literature and Art Forms. And I would like to request our participant and attendees who are with us on the YouTube stream to contribute to the discussion by their observations, appreciations, as well as questions through the Telegram chat group at the handle International Webinar on Contemporary World Literature and Art Forms. Our first speaker for the day is Professor Mohammad Asim Siddiqui, who is at the English Department, distinguished faculty at the Aligarh Muslim University, and has more than 30 years of experience in teaching. He completed his PhD on Mark Twain from AMU, and his areas of interest include literary theory, Indian and Pakistani writing in English, culture studies, film studies, research methodology, and academic writing. He was a Fulbright Fellow at New York State uh, New York University in the year 2007. He's a member of the Acad Academic Committee of Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla. He's also the managing editor of the Urdu translation of the complete works of Baba Sahib, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, a project of Ambedkar Foundation under the Ministry of Social Justice and Environment. Professor Asim Siddiqui has been on the editorial board of many literary and cultural journals. He's a reviewer for Oxford University Press, Rutledge, Taylor and Francis, Sahit Academy, and many other publication houses. His articles have been published in reputed journals and books, and he is a regular columnist for newspapers, magazines, news portals, and writes regularly for the uh, uh, Hindu. His articles have also appeared in The Guardian, Hindustan Times, The Statesman, The Indian Express, Pioneer, Frontline, India Today Magazine, Scroll, NDTD, NDTV, Rediff, NewsClick, and many other magazines and news portals. We're looking forward to his talk today, which is on the topic, Traveling Art Forms, A Case of Guzzle. So over to you now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fatma Nuri. Thank you very much. And uh, I thank, uh, I thank uh, your college, Jagat Narayan Degree College, for inviting me to this uh, international webinar. I must compliment you for uh, choosing a wonderful topic because uh, this is uh, a very relevant topic. You're talking about world literature and of course, uh, it's a very big, big uh, area. And I'm happy to see resource persons from uh, different uh, countries, different places, different disciplines, say joining this platform. And uh, I must thank uh, Professor Kamla Dubey, Dr. Pratima Chaitanya, and of course, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Arnab Dattaroy, i meeting him for the first time. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, good to share this platform with you. And uh, good to share uh, some of uh, my experiences of this particular topic. You see, the topic that is uh, announced is uh, certain literary forms. And uh, here I'll be very, very specific because I'll be talking about just uh, one of the many literary forms, which in fact uh, is a very important form, especially in India, and which is a very important form in our popular culture. And that particular form goes by the name of Ghazal, right? Of course, we can talk about so many other uh, forms which had uh, an origin in a particular place, but now those forms have become very popular 
if just uh, if we just talk about uh, a very dominant form like novel to which a reference was made uh, just a while ago you know that uh, novel is considered a european form and somebody like milan kundra is speaks so eloquently about uh, novel in his art the novel but uh, you know that novel is uh, also today practiced uh, by say number of writers in different languages and of course uh, indians have made uh, a big name for themselves in the field of novel writing in fact to just give you a, a very say light hearted i mean example i was uh, reading a novel by hanif qureshi and uh, there was one situation in that novel hanif qureshi introduce a character a minor character an indian woman and he said oh you are an indian woman but you are not writing a novel so there you see that uh, india has made a big name for itself because as far as novel is concerned and of course one can also think about uh, certain other uh, very popular forms you, which you see on uh, social media a form like haiku which of course had its beginning uh, in japan and then isra pond picked up that form and he made that form popular in the western world and today you know that uh, haiku is uh, being practiced in different languages i can uh, quote some haikus written by say some urdu poets shayar among uh, many poets wrote many haikus so that means uh, forms travel and you know that it is not only forms which travel rather ideas travel and today in our age of globalization we talk about deterritorialize deterritorialization and uh, we say that uh, certain uh, ideas probably can uh, say cross boundaries they can transcend boundaries and there are thousand examples where we can say okay cuisines travel we say that uh, dress styles travel we say that uh, linguistic forms travel languages travel and of course say travel or migration or migration of ideas migration of people this is a fact of life so probably if we just uh, try to say please uh, this travel of one particular literary form in the larger perspective we will say that okay there is nothing new about it because uh, all things travel people travel ideas travel ideologies travel and of course uh, say cuisines travel dress styles travel all things actually travel so one of the greatest myths of our time is that probably things have a particular origin and they remain there and in fact uh, we have been harmed by this uh, ideology of origins in different ways so here uh, we are talking about uh, one particular form and this particular form happens to be ghazal now let's just think about uh, some very common examples you know that most of us have uh, followed many hindi film songs most of us have followed uh, music most of us have followed popular music but let it, let me just uh, quote a few examples which all of you must have at least uh, followed aa ko chahiye aa ko chahiye ek umr asar hone tak kaun jeeta hai teri zulf ke sar hone tak now these are famous lines of ghalib and of course ghalib was made popular by number of ghazal singers and uh, one important ghazal singer who made all hugely popular in india was jagjit singh and of course uh, credit also goes to gulzar sahib because he made that popular television serial on the life of ghalib and where jagjit singh and chitra singh they sang many ghazals of ghalib and uh, so those uh, words and those songs became even more popular than they were earlier similarly if i just uh, quote a few more lines ये न थी हमारी किस्मत के विशाल यार होता ये न थी हमारी किस्मत के विशाल यार होता यू मस्ट हर्ड दिस लाइन ओके इफ वी लीव असाइड समबडी लाइक मिर्जा गालिब एंड वी थिंक अबाउट सम पॉपुलर सॉन्ग्स एंड विच आर दोज पॉपुलर सॉन्ग्स कभी खुद पे कभी हालात पे रोना आया बात निकली तो हर एक बात पे रोना आया यू मस्ट हैव हर्ड दिस सॉन्ग और अ सॉन्ग लाइक दिस तुम अपना रंजो गम अपनी परेशानी मुझे दे दो और दिस सॉन्ग मैं जिंदगी का साथ निभाता चला गया आई थिंक यू मस्ट हैव हर्ड दिस सॉन्ग मैं जिंदगी का साथ निभाता चला गया हर फिक्र को धुएं में उड़ाता चला गया बर्बादियों का शोक मनाना फिजूल था बर्बादियों का जश्न मनाना चलाता चला गया सो वॉट यू सी हेयर देर इज ए पर्टिकुलर फिलोसफी ऑफ लाइफ विच इज कैप्चर्ड बाई ईच ऑफ दीज कपलेट्स एंड वी कैन पॉसिबली रिमेंबर the lyricists also who wrote these uh, 
famous lines and it was sahil ludhyanvi and in fact uh, in the morning today a friend sent me a special number of a magazine on sahil because uh, we are celebrating uh, the anniversary of 100 say centenary of sahil and there uh, Uh, so in the introduction one interesting point was made and that interesting point was that uh, whenever uh, you just uh, your attention is really grabbed by the twist in a song invariably that song would have been written by sahir so that means there is something in sahir's poetry which immediately captures your attention which immediately holds a kind of appeal for us so what is there about this song also that you can say okay this is a uh, a floss there is a certain philosophy here in a talk show actually uh, uh, javed akhtar was talk, uh, he himself is a good ghazal uh, writer javed akhtar was talking about sahir and he mentioned one important fact he said that uh, often sahir has introduced some very difficult words also in his poetry but how is it that uh, despite introducing those difficult words his uh, poetry was hugely popular and the reason him sahir himself gave so i said that if there are two lines if i am talking about a couplet then in one line i may introduce difficult words but the next line will have very simple words so people who understand those simple words in a line they can easily guess the meaning of even difficult words in a couplet so that means uh, he was one who could uh, say practice ghazal he was one who could say who could refuse to compromise with the quality but still he was able to say produce those ghazals which were hugely popular with his audience now we can uh, say probably remember some other uh, poets also and here i am giving just uh, a few more examples you must have heard this song also ye kya jagah hai dosto ye kaun sa dayar hai and uh, these are uh, this is uh, the first line of uh, a famous uh, ghazal by shahriyar and it was used in umrah jaan umrah jaan and we uh, we sure umrah rekha umrah jaan not ashwari rai umrah jaan where uh, lot of liberty was taken with the ghazal form and similarly there is another uh, very popular uh, ghazal say by shahriyar seene mein jalan aankhon mein toofan sa kyun hai is har is is sheher mein har shakhs pareshan sa kyun hai you must have heard that uh, ghazal also now probably we have heard all these ghazals and uh, if you tune to your uh, transistor or youtube and you will find that uh, you love ghazals but uh, an ordinary reader or an ordinary follower of ghazal probably does not pause and think about the ghazal form that means it is possible to enjoy a ghazal and it is possible to relish a ghazal but uh, it is possible it is also possible to miss say its uh, quality to miss its formal structure to miss what is there so special about this form so if i just uh, think about all these examples which i just quoted there is something which is uh, probably common to all these examples and what is that thing common that all these examples suggest a particular arrangement of words a particular arrangement of sounds and a particular way in which sounds are repeated a particular way in which a particular rhyme scheme is followed so that means ghazal follows a particular kind of structure a particular kind of rhyme scheme right and uh, if we just uh, break a ghazal into different parts we'll say that uh, okay there are certain important terms which are used in a ghazal and these are all urdu terms but uh, if we are talking about ghazal probably we can understand a little bit about these terms now these terms are misra sheer radif qafia matla maqta takhallus right i repeat misra sheer radif qafia matla maqta takhallus now if we just uh, define each of these words we'll say that a ghazal consists of a number of shares right and a share will be translated usually as a couplet and a share consists of two misras right 
and two misras are halves of a shear that means one half is called a misra and two halves constitute a shear and the first shear of a ghazal is called matla that means uh, which means literally means horizon something which is emerging something which is coming out and hence matla similarly you can say that the ghazal is springing forth it is emerging it is appearing on the horizon and the most important thing is that both misras of a matla have a qafiya now if we just uh, see this particular word qafiya which is refrain and if we see this ghazal ye na thi hamari qismat ke wisal yaar hota agar aur jeete rehte yahi intezar hota so if you see wisal yaar yaar intezar right here similarly tere vaade par jiye hum to jaan ye jhoot jana ke khushi se mar na jaate agar aitbar hota yaar aitbar intezar these are all rhyming words so if we follow a particular ghazal we know that a ghazal is following a particular rhyme scheme right and uh, if we think about this ghazal then we say that now all these popular songs that you followed which i just mentioned next time try to just uh, follow those songs again say that song main zindagi ke sath nibhata chala gaya har fikr ko dhue mein udata chala gaya you see that uh, there it will follow that particular kind of rhyme scheme that means uh, a particular kind of refrain you will find in that song and similarly in lots of other songs hindi songs that we follow they are actually ghazals and why they are ghazals because they follow a particular rhyme scheme and if we follow that rhyme scheme we know that ghazal has a kind of tight structure ghazal has a kind of bound structure right so this means uh, that uh, ghazal is practiced both at a popular level and by classical urdu poets say for somebody like meer wrote ghazals somebody like ghalib wrote ghazals and in fact ghazal is considered the crowning glory of urdu literature there are other aspects of a ghazal and what you can say is that a ghazal usually consists of 5 7 or more couplets so usually in a cup ghazal the number of couplets is odd so 5 7 9 often you can have a ghazal of just uh, five couplets so this is something which is uh, uh, special about ghazal now i would also like to share the screen so that you can have a uh, uh, host has uh, uh, host disabled part screen screen sharing can i share the screen uh, fatima Yes, sir. Uh, we'll just allow you to be the co-host. Just yes. a minute. Yes, sir. You are the co-host now. yes so here uh, we can also read uh, some points here that uh, ghazal is uh, a very popular form in uh, mushairas and you know that uh, mushaira is uh, a kind of poetic performance where uh, number of poets actually not only read not only recite but they also in a way perform poetry and here this is one important aspect of uh, a particular form of literature in india where you can say this particular form of literature actually has a kind of oral dimension where it is heard actually and similarly 
this particular form has a kind of oral dimension so if we say that okay in the western world maybe print enjoys a kind of primacy in many eastern forms in many indian forms you say that uh, the oral dimension becomes very important and the oral aspect of poetry becomes very important orality is important and similarly oral dimension where we hear literature that becomes very important and that is why you will find that there has been this convention where uh, people often go to mushairas and they write important couplets in a diary and uh, later uh, they recite those couplets for their own pleasure furthermore you can say that ghazal has become popular because it is also in a way accompanied by music and uh, part of the reason why many of those uh, hindi film songs which are actually ghazals they are hugely popular because they are accompanied by music so this means uh, another very important aspect of ghazal is this element of musicality that means music and ghazal form they go together and that's why it is always very easy to remember a ghazal that is why it is always so so easy to remember those film songs where you have that very strong element of music and we remember most of those film songs right and that is why it is not always very easy to remember certain forms which are not accompanied by music so here we are that uh, when we think about ghazal all these things become important and of course another very important aspect of ghazal is that uh, each couplet in a ghazal has a kind of independent existence that means if there are uh, five couplets in a ghazal then those five couplets probably will convey five different ideas and each couplet can stand for itself each couplet can have a kind of independent existence this is not the case say with other poetic forms so in ghazal each couplet is independent and you see that uh, what is the reason that uh, often in conversations often in talks often in lectures often in serious discussions speakers often quote a couplet because a couplet probably can say a lot which otherwise could not have been said and that is why a particular couplet because it has an independent existence it can be quoted in different context so this is the quality of this particular form that if it has number of independent couplets and those independent couplets constitute a ghazal each can each couplet can be used differently recited differently employed in different places and co in different places and you'll see that uh, our uh, hindi film scripts actually use those couplets good conversation also meant using those couplets to good effect and a good speaker a good lecturer and a good public speaker often uses couplets to buttress his or her point so here we can see that uh, ghazal has all these features and of course usually in a ghazal you will also say that ghazal actually exists at different levels so it is not simply the literal meaning in a ghazal but rather it is the metaphorical meaning in a ghazal which becomes important so probably you can uh, notice words like uh, sharab or shama parwana dil jigar or many of those words and similarly you can also notice some references to preachers some references to say religious people some references to ecclesiastical figures say for example references to nasse references to say holy figures but usually those holy figures are uh, treated very satirically in the ghazal that means ghazal also has that kind of secular spirit and because it has that kind of secular spirit it has a kind of spirit against bigotry it has a kind of spirit against fundamentalism 
it is a it has a kind of split uh, say in favor of a kind of uh, material richness of the world but at the same time ghazal can also strike those spiritual notes so what we see that uh, these are stock figures in a ghazal you can uh, see references to lover you can see references to driver you can see references to beloved but uh, what you can be very sure about is that ghazal has unequivocally secular non religious character most ghazals are actually against dogma so but in the hands of uh, lesser poets ghazal can be reduced to a formula and that is something which distinguishes a very important ghazal writer like ghalib from ordinary ghazal writers where they can reduce ghazal to a formula to certain cliches right so that's why uh, if the form is popular the form also allows great elasticity where there is scope for saying a lot so for example if you follow ghazal uh, ghalib ghazals you'll see that okay uh, ghazals stand at, at different levels there is that spiritual level there is that metaphysical level and of course there is also that uh, mundane level at which you can read that ghazal so that means uh, literal meaning can be important but more important it is the metaphorical meaning so here you see that uh, and we can also say that uh, ghazal is a kind of form which is uh, marked for its brevity but because it is brief because it is apt so it should achieve a lot through some few words and that is the quality of a ghazal so what is important here is that uh, you can find uh, philosophy you can find mythology and you can find all these qualities in a ghazal so here uh, we can say that uh, probably it is the most quotable of all genres the literal meaning of the word ghazal is of course is speaking to women and now we come to that important point which is there in the topic itself and that important point is the travel of ideas we know that uh, ghazal is a very popular form in india we know that ghazal has been a very popular form in urdu poetry but uh, from where has this particular form come so one answer is okay it has come from persia it has come from persia that means it has come from iran and you know that uh, there was a time when uh, persian was a very important language in india and it was only in the first half of uh, the 19th century that uh, you know that in mid 19th century english education would be introduced in india but uh, before that urdu started replacing uh, uh, persian and before that you know that persian was the most important language in india and so that's why you have uh, a whole tradition in indian literature sabka hindi tradition where you had many of those uh, indian poets who were writing in persian and uh, they were using all those forms in persian and you can say that actually persian literary forms have been adopted by all urdu poets so today probably you cannot separate urdu literary form from persian literary forms you will find a kind of common ground and similarly when we are talk uh, when we are talking about hindi then hindi has also been greatly influenced by many of these forms which were say used in these languages so you can say that okay ghazal was used in india ghazal was in, say became ghazal became very popular in india but actually ghazal came from persia and uh, all important persian poets and here we are talking about uh, 10th century and 11th century when ghazal was being written and uh, you can think about all important names like for example hafiz shirazi or rumi or uh, say shet sadi they all wrote actually ghazals but in persia also ghazal is not even native to persia so it has come from arabic there it has come from this place arabic and you know that in uh, arabic there was one particular tradition 
where uh, certain heroes or tribal lords or patrons say they were presented certain poems and they were called qasida and qasida in urdu today means praise high praise so here uh, we see that the form had its beginning in arabic poetry in the 6th century in arabic poetry particular genre of poetry was called qasida and which was used to praise heroes and patrons right and i am quoting the words of uh, one uh, famous writer gopin chand narang who wrote uh, i am quoting him it was a small initial part of the qasida called tashbib tashbib where subjects like nature or female beauty were discussed to warm up the audience before the poet started the praise of his tribal warrior or downgrading the enemy now from arabs the form reached persia and of course uh, in persia it developed most of its features but when it reached india and when ghazal was written in a more liberal climate in india then obviously indian culture influenced ghazal greatly and here one important point which is uh, made by professor gopi chand narang in his book on ghazal a gift of uh, india's composite culture he talks about composite culture where you see that uh, hindus and muslims they contributed to a culture they produce a very rich culture and this particular culture also produce literature and one very say important uh, form of literature that this composite culture produce was ghazal was ghazal and that's why you'll see that uh, all urdu poets who have written ghazals they have talked about indian festivals they have talked about uh, the richness that india offers the richness that india's geography offers the richness that india's uh, culture offers so they have talked about holi they have talked about indian colors indian festivals indian dialects indian people in other words say so the kind of richness that indian culture offers ghazal can include or it has included all possible features of the richness of indian culture so here uh, we can uh, say that uh, ghazal of course it came from arabic and from arabic it came to persia and from persia or from persian it came to india but in india in the liberal climate of india it developed certain features and so we can say that ghazal probably is the most indian of all literary forms and that is why it is so popular and that is why you will find that all poets irrespective of their religion they have practiced ghazals so here uh, maybe we can just uh, say substantiate this point further that ghazal actually has evolved in india and you can say that pre predominantly expressing the emotion of love ghazal's canvas has included philosophy religion and politics the concepts of love beauty and self are dominant themes in classical poets who include among others khwaja mir dard siraj aurangabadi Shah Niaz Ahmed Bareilly, Shah Hatim, Sauda, Mir, Insha, Momin, Zafar, Hali, and of course the two giants, that is Mir Taqi Mir and Asadullah Khan Khalid. We can also talk about two very important schools of Ghazal. One was Delhi, and one was Lucknow. You can say that Delhi school probably offered a very different kind of uh, richness. where tasawwuf was the flavor mysticism was the flavor and lucknow school offered a kind of poetry which was marked by a kind of sensuousness so you can say that uh, if uh, one is interested in a kind of sensual pleasure that art can give then many lucknow poets actually practice that form and offer that kind of sensual pleasure, pleasure through their poetry on the other hand delhi poetry or delhi school was uh, especially remarkable for using ideas of the tasawwuf or mysticism we can say that uh, in the second half of the 19th century 
there was a kind of clamor for change and what was that clamor say somebody like altaf hussain hali or uh, at that time even sir sayed ahmed khan or uh, another important urdu critic mohammad hussain azad they actually made a case against certain uh, stereotypical words or stereotypical ideas used in ghazals that means uh, they talked about avoiding a formula in ghazal that means no clish expression no formal like expressions so because of their voice against those expressions what happened was that a new form a different form nazm in fact made its appearance and so for many years you'll see that uh, it was not ghazal but rather it was nazm which uh, was a very important form but of course ghazal never died down never in fact disappeared from the scene and even when uh, you had a very different kind of literary movement in urdu in hindi and of course in different indian languages in uh, 1930s and that movement was called progressive writers movement progressive writers movement they talked about a particular kind of poetry they talked about uh, say emancipation they talked about uh, liberty they talked about equality they raised their voice against colonialism they talked about nationalism and you see that many important poets uh, like firag gorakhpuri and uh, sahiluddin vi or majaz or uh, anand narayan mulla or ali sardar jafri they in fact are the champions of progressive poetry so their ghazal actually also underwent change and you see that the symbols used by these poets are very different so suddenly from ashik or from ashu or from uh, those say staples or those uh, traditional symbols in ghazal we see that uh, poets are talking about uh, workers poet poets are talking about uh, say workplace karkhanas factories right and uh, they are talking about these ideas liberty equality exploitation so in a way say, say you have a very different kind of flavor which is introduced by their ghazals and uh, here uh, we can just uh, uh, think about one or two lines say for example uh, kafi azmi right kafi azmi can write बस्ती में अपनी हिंदू मुसलमान जो बस गए इंसान की शक्ल देखने को हम तरस गए दीज आर लाइन अगेन सो कैफी आजमी इज इंट्रोड्यूसिंग ए वेरी डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ फ्लेवर बस्ती में अपनी हिंदू मुसलमान जो बस गए इंसान की शक्ल देखने को हम तरस गए और फॉर एग्जाम्पल समबडी लाइक असरारुल हक मजाज ही इज ऑल्सो फेमस फॉर राइटिंग द यूनिवर्सिटी तराना ऑफ अलीगढ़ मुस्लिम यूनिवर्सिटी लेटराना से ये मेरा चमन ये मेरा चमन मैं अपने चमन का बुलबुल हूँ दिस इज अ वेरी से पॉपुलर तराना एंड ऑफ कोर्स इट इज संग ऑन डिफरेंट अकेजन बट इफ यू सी मजाज नाउ ही इज ऑल्सो राइटिंग गजल बट अगेन ही इज ऑल्सो ऑफरिंग ए वेरी डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ फ्लेवर सो वेन ही इज टॉकिंग अबाउट हिज बिलविड वेन ही इज टॉकिंग अबाउट द आंचल ऑफ हिज बिलविड वॉट कैन ही से तेरे माथे पे ये आंचल तो बहुत ही खूब है लेकिन तेरे माथे पे ये आंचल तो बहुत ही खूब है लेकिन तू इस आंचल से एक परचम बना लेती तो अच्छा था परचम मींस फ्लैग झंडा तू इस आंचल से एक परचम बना लेती तो अच्छा था सो हियर ही इज टॉकिंग अबाउट अ बिलविड ही इज टॉकिंग अबाउट द आंचल ऑफ हिज बिलविड एंड आंचल यू नो इज ए वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट रोमांटिक इमेज बट सडनली दैट इमेज इज इनवर्टेड एंड इन द नेक्स्ट लाइन यू सी दैट Archel probably loses out to Parcham flag. So here you can see this kind of nationalist spirit informing Majaz poetry, and you'll find that this kind of nationalist spirit is there in uh, Kafi Azmi, in Majlis Zanpuri, in Ali Sardar Jafri, and the reason why many of those progressive poets also went to jail, of course, Magdum Muhyiddin, and uh, on the other side. of the border also you can mention somebody like faiz ahmed faiz uh, whose poetry also has that kind of revolutionary fervor so you see that uh, even progressive poets are writing ghazals 
but ghazal has a very different kind of flavor in their hands of course uh, ghazal has also been written in the later phase and if we talk about uh, urdu literature in 50s and 60s you'll see that uh, poets are writing ghazals of course uh, that phase in urdu literature is considered the phase of jadidiyat or uh, if we can translate that loosely we'll say that this is the phase of uh, modernism right now here uh, something else is also very important you know that ghazal was so popular that it also crossed shores of india and it transcended in fact all boundaries and here i would like to mention one very interesting experiment which was done by ijaz ahmed i hope uh, you have heard the name of ijaz ahmed ijaz ahmed uh, is the writer of that famous book in theory in theory he is an important post colonial critic in that and the book that i am talking about here uh, ijaz ahmed was greatly interested in ghalib's poetry but you know that it is so difficult to translate poetry and it is so difficult to translate ghalib in english of course there have been efforts to translate poetry and that is why you have uh, one uh, very famous uh, line of wisdom about poetry and that line of wisdom is what is lost in translation is poetry so that means uh, what is lost that is poetry but of course translators have also achieved a lot so we cannot uh, probably minimize their importance i am talking about ijaz ahmed's experiment what he did was he talked to some important uh, english poets and adrian rich was uh, one of those important american poets ijaz ahmed gave a certain concept to adrian rich a certain concept to some english poets and what was that concept that concept was the key concept in the ghazal of ghalib adrian rich does not understand ghalib's language that way or she did not understand that way but she understood the concept she understood the idea she understood the notion which was there in ghalib's ghazal so using that notion using that idea in a couplet using that concept in a couplet she wrote a ghazal so that means this was a translation of a different kind translation of a concept translation of an idea of course the idea is borrowed from ghalib but here the poet is giving it a different kind of poetic treatment so this was one experiment and of course there were other efforts also to translate to literally translate those ghazals of ghalib so that book ghazals of ghalib by ijaz ahmed gives you very good examples of literal translations as well as poetic translations of ghazals of ghalib and there you'll find that uh, those poetic translations of ghazal actually read better than literal translation although in that case probably you may not be able to identify easily if it is the ghazal of ghalib but certainly that idea is there and which is used to give it a different form so edin rich edin rich actually wrote and published many ghazals and she herself says that uh, she was inspired by ghalib she says that my ghazals are personal and i am quoting her words my ghazals are personal and public american and 20th century but they owe much to the presence of ghalib in mind right similarly australian poet whose name is judith right she also wrote ghazals and again i am quoting her words she maintained a thematic continuity and these are the words of one very important uh, writer of her times anisur rahman anisur rahman sahab has also translated ghazals of different poets and you can see his book that book is beautifully titled hazaro khwahishi aisi it is published by harper collins 
so he has also translated a number of ghazals and in fact his book is interesting in the sense that you will get a very fair idea about each important urdu poet who wrote ghazals and then his own translation of those ghazals right so here i am quoting his words as for australian poet duty tried he observes she maintained thematic continuity in her couplets and gave her companion compositions a title this is interesting duty tried gave a title to her ghazals so otherwise in urdu literary form when ghazal is used ghazal is not given a title but duty tried gave a title so when a ghazal travels from one place to another say when it travels to australia and when it is practiced in english by duty tried duty tried also gives a title in english in urdu don't have a title now we can also say that uh, one very important indian poet made ghazal popular in the western world and this indian poet is kashmiri poet kashmiri english poet aga shahid ali aga shahid ali himself wrote ghazals in english and aga shahid ali was also very very particular about using all those conventions which in fact have defined ghazals in english that means a ghazal is considered a bound form where there are certain restrictions on meter on rhythm on rhyme then aga shahid ali would uh, like all his followers all his friends to follow those restrictions that means one cannot take liberty with the form and so aga shahid ali wrote actually ghazals in number of ghazals and i can mention two of his books the country without a post office and rooms are not finished both these books of poems include his ghazals i'll just quote uh, some lines from aga shahid ali's poetry right and uh, here are the first second third and the last couplets of the ghazal in the country without a post office and mind you this is in english where are you now who lies beneath your spell tonight before you agonize him in farewell tonight 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 repetition where are you now who lies beneath your spell tonight before you agonize him in farewell tonight repetition of tonight this is radiv pale hands that once loved me beside the shalimar whom el from rapture's road will you expel tonight tonight again repetition those fabrics of kashmir to make me beautiful trinket to gem me to adorn how tell tonight and i shahid only am escaped to tell thee god sobs in my arms call me ismail tonight call me ismail tonight so what you can see here as can be seen there are all essential features of ghazal present in this poem words such as spell again i am reading where are you now who lies beneath your spell tonight before you agonize him in farewell tonight pale hand that once loved him beside the shalimar whom else from rapture's road will you expel tonight so you see that spell expel tonight tonight so words such as spell farewell expel and tell constitute the kafia right and tonight is the radif of this ghazal and in the last couplet and in the last couplet what is there and i shahid only am escaped to tell thee this is in the last couplet the maqta this is called maqta which ends the ghazal the poet uses his name shahid so this is uh, his name and you know that uh, this is also a convention in a ghazal that the poet uses his own name in the last couplet and here aga shahid ali is using his name shahid right so you see that uh, aga shahid ali made ghazals popular and here i would like to just uh, end this talk by reciting a ghazal which is uh, written by one important poet hollander and this is a ghazal on ghazal this is a ghazal on ghazal before i 
read this, I can tell you that Ghazal has also been practiced in German and in many other European languages. Ghazal has also been practiced in Punjabi, in Hindi, in Bengali, and I'm not sure about South Indian languages, but you can say that safely say that in almost all languages. So here I am just reading this very popular Ghazal written by Hollander and it is on Ghazal. For couplets, the ghazal is prime at the end. Of each lines, a refrain like a chime at the end. But in subsequent couplets throughout the whole poem, it is this second line only will rhyme at the end. One such a string of strange, unpronounceable fruits, how fine the familiar old line at the end. All of our writing is silent, the dance of the hand, so that what it comes down to all mime at the end, dust and ashes, how dainty and dry, we decay to our messy primordial slime at the end. Two frail arms of your delicate form I pursue, inaccessible, vibrant, sublime at the end. You gathered all manner of flowers all day, but your hands were most fragrant of rhyme at the end. There are so many sounds, a poem having one rhyme, a good life with sad minor crime at the end. Each new couplet is a different ascent no great peak, but a low hill quite easy to climb at the end. To arm bandits, start out with a green wad of green thoughts, but you are left with a dime at the end. Each assertion of a knot, which must shorten, alas, this long worded rope of which I am at the end. So here you see that uh, this gives you an idea of uh, Ghazal, which actually had a beginning in Arabic. It traveled to Persia. From Persia, it came to India. And in India, it is practiced in different languages. And of course, it was taken up by English poets. It was made popular by Aga Shahid Ali. And, from, and uh, it is made popular also by a number of American poets. And here we mentioned uh, Adrian Rich. And of course, it is also practiced in Australia, one very important Australian poet, Judith Wright, right, results. And probably we can uh, quote more examples, but uh, this uh, brief conversation gives us a fair idea of uh, a very important form, which has bound nature, where th there are certain restrictions, and which of course is a very important form in Urdu literature, and which has say taken influences and which has influenced other literary forms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. There are very few academic lectures you fall in love with. And this was one of those, Ghazal being one of my favorite forms. So uh, we are really very thankful to you, sir, for your lecture. Uh, sir, you have answered most of the questions which were raised by our students during the lecture. There were students who were asking whether uh, other languages can be made use of instead of Urdu. So that question you have answered. But we have still a few questions by our students. There is a, there is a question by Diksha Chaudhary from Jagataran Girls Degree College. And uh, uh, her question is that, is rhyme an important part of ghazal? Is rhyme indispensable to ghazal? Can there be a ghazal without, without rhyme? Actually, this, even this particular uh, say, aspect was discussed, it is indispensable. Okay, and uh, I was making this point that Aga Shahid Ali actually made great efforts to stress this point that, okay, if you are writing Ghazal, then uh, you must uh, use those rules of Radif, right? You must uh, follow a particular kind of refrain. So if uh, my answer to Diksha is, say, please uh, say, follow these songs again. Okay, all these popular songs again, which I just uh, mentioned, and you you will yourself notice that uh, there, uh, say a particular kind of rhyme is followed, and I'll say that uh, that is a beautiful song. Me zindagi ke saath nibhata chala gaya, har fikr ko dhuye me udata chala gaya, barbadiyon ka sog manana fizul tha, barbadiyon ka jash manata chala gaya. So you see, me zindagi ke saath nibhata chala gaya, and later barbadiyon ka jash manata chala gaya. Gham aur khushi me غم اور خوشی میں فرق نہ محسوس ہو جگہ میں میں دل کو اس مقام پر لاتا چلا گیا لاتا چلا گیا سو اسی اسی دیٹ دیٹ رائم از دیئر دیٹ فرین از دیئر دیٹ پرٹیکولر اسٹرکچر از دیئر سو دیٹ از این ایسینشیل پارٹ آف اے غزل تھینک یو سر 
Thank you so much, sir. I hope Diksha, your question is answered. There is another question by Nitika Shivastav of Jagataran Girls Degree College. She writes, nowadays music industry is diverting towards absurd and obscene songs. How can we revive the guzzle culture back in our society? I will say that guzzle culture is very much there. And uh, I will not make uh, a kind of value judgment that uh, this is vulgar or this is obscene because uh, what I consider, uh, uh, what I like, maybe somebody else may not like. So, sir, I will not make that kind of value judgment. But yes, uh, uh, if you see, uh, for example, a film like Ashki 2, you see that there are beautiful songs there. And again, I am saying that uh, whenever you like a song, just try to think whether it is ghazal. So that means we often uh, like certain songs and not necessarily those old songs, but also new songs which are coming. And uh, you see that uh, those songs actually uh, are still with us and you have some beautiful songs uh, even uh, now. So I'll say that, okay, uh, there is a scope for good songs. There is a scope for good music even now. And uh, that is coming out. And especially with YouTube, when everything is available. So probably we never had uh, this kind of, uh, say, opportunity as we have now to listen to good music and to listen to good songs. And uh, viewers never had this kind of choice earlier, which they enjoy now. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. I would now summarize Professor Asim Siddiqui's lecture. Uh, during the course of his lecture, Professor Siddiqui mentioned that the history of literature is also the history of the travel of ideas and that many important literary forms have traveled from one place to another, be them the major forms like the novel or more particular forms like haiku. He then added that one important genre that has traveled a great deal and has evolved as a result of traveling is the guzzle form. He further points out that the development of forms from the Arabs to Persians to Indians has a long trajectory. So before, sir, I bid you goodbye, I would like to summarize your entire idea of this traveling and traveling of ideas and guzzle from one part to the other in the following lines by Majru Sultan Puri. Main akele hi chala tha janibe manzil magar. Main akele hi chala tha janibe manzil magar. Log saath aate gaye aur karwa banta gaya. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Professor Siddiqui, for your lecture. Thank you. The second resource person for today is a very young and vibrant uh, professor, visiting professor, author, Dr. Annab Datta Roy from USA. So Annab hails from Allahabad. I'm calling him Annab because he was junior to me and I know him from the university days here. So may I now request Dr. Fatima Nuri to please introduce Dr. Annab Datta Roy to the attendees. Dr. Fatima, please. Um. Thank you, Professor Siddiqui, for uh, this wonderful walk through the Ghazal uh, form and uh, how it uh, 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 was taken over by Aga Shahid Ali to the American continent. And uh, you wa walked us through it uh, in a very lucid manner. I'm pretty sure our students would have uh, enjoyed it and would have been able to learn a lot from your lecture. But uh, let me introduce our next speaker for the day. Uh, Dr. Arnav Datta Roy. He received his PhD in Comparative Literary and Culture Studies from the University of Connecticut with specializations in human rights, post-colonial theory, and modern uh, South Asian literature. His book project, Universalism in South Asian Literature, draws on interdisciplinary work from the field of post-colonial post -colonial theory, literary cognition, gender and sexuality, narrative empathy and human rights to analyze literary responses to colonialism in a range of modern works produced in Hindi, Bangla and English. Uh, Arnav, by the way, uh, can speak uh, the three languages with equal ease. 
His works have appeared in peer-reviewed journals such as South Asian Review, Humanities, uh, the Literary Universals Project. And his research bears fundamentally on his pedagogy, which has developed and refined over the last 10 years, uh, teaching courses on world, world literature, human rights, and post-colonial theory in institutions that include Stockton University, University of Connecticut, and the Illinois State University. Uh, Anav is also a poet, a singer, and he plays the guitar and the synthesizer. Uh, his talk today is on narrative empathy and conflict in Mirza Wahid's The Book of Golden Leaves. So I'll let Anav take over the stage and uh, here we are. Okay. You need to unmute yourself, Anav. I always forget doing that. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today and for that very generous introduction. And thank you, everybody. This um, I'm really honored to be a part of this platform. Um, and yes, I mean, it's great to be back. Uh, um, I mean, and, and I, I think like the pandemic has done a lot of harm to all of us, but one thing that it has worked for many of us is it has like brought brought us together in ways that were probably like unimaginable before i mean technology always ex existed but like the pandemic brought this urgency to do do like get together virtually and and this is an example of that and i don't think i'd be here big unless like uh, the pandemic is a big reason for me being here because the virtual platform has become so important in our times now. But, um, and again, thank you, Dr. Chaitanya for that wonderful introduction, Dr. Nuri uh, and great talk, Dr. Siddiqui. I mean, uh, some of the points that you made about Ghazal is something that I feel very deeply about. And I, I teach Aga Shahid Ali in my courses and, and I do make some of the points that you brought up Right. I, I try to communicate that to my students, particularly the structure, how structure is important in the poetic form of Ghazal and, and how Ali has masterfully like translated that form in English. And I mean, I don't wanna talk a lot about Ali because I also know that Dr. Nuri here is an expert on Akashahid Ali, so I don't wanna overstep my boundaries, but, uh, uh, the, today my talk would be about modern Kashmiri literature to a certain extent. Uh, and I think uh, Ali figures centrally in that project. So I'm very glad that Dr. Siddiqui, you did bring him up because that does provide me a nice segue into what I wanna talk about today. And also another thing that is centrally important that I feel, I mean, important to literature is, uh, I mean, the genre of like, how are you communicating your ideas? And uh, Dr. Siddiqui, you kind of uh, emphasize that the gaz gazal like it, it it treats a lot of different themes it treats heroism it treats politics but one of the central themes that it it like the the foundational theme upon which a gazal often operates is love and romance and i think it and 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 that again is another segue into what i want to talk about because um, the popular conception is that romance is often it's good it, it's it's nice to talk about love and, and things that are tender in our lives right but there's there's a con conception that uh, the romantic genre is often not a good vehicle for communicating political ideas, revolutionary ideas but many of the practitioners of Ghazal, including Shahid Ali, Faiz Ahmed Faiz, and so many of these other folks have shown us that's probably not true because Ghazal can also 
communicate powerful social ideas. And I do want to talk a little about that uh, in my talk today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. It's okay. Okay, so uh, the title of my presentation is Narrative Empathy and Conflict in Mirza Wahid's Book of Gold Leaves. Uh, and as you can see, the main subject of this talk would be empathy. Now, uh, empathy is an emotion that is increasingly, uh, that is, it's an emotion that scholars are increasingly gravitating towards as a subject of study. Because many feel that it is that emotion that allows humans to uh, behave socially. So, I mean, and it, as a definition, empathy is something, I mean, when we say I, I am empathizing with someone, I, I, I kind of assume that, I, I kind of mean that I feel the other's pain. So it is different from sympathy in that sense, because when I say I'm sympathetic to somebody, I, I mean like, I, I, I feel bad that, or good that this person is experiencing something. I do not necessarily myself feel that emotion. So empathy in that sense is different from sympathy because empathy, we, we assume that we are feeling what the other person is feeling. So if, if somebody has experienced loss uh, because of a, a, a close, um, a, a near one passed away. So I can say I am empathize with that person because I know what it feels to experience loss. So in that sense, empathy kind of inspires a connection, a very intimate connection between people who may be very different, who may not share a language, who may not share a culture, who may not share like customs or traditions. So empathy, at least in theory, has the capacity to bring people from diverse backgrounds. It has the capacity to build bridges in that sense. So that is what, that is the functional definition that I'm working with in this project. So what does empathy, what does it have to do with, uh, uh, what does it have to do with literature? I mean, there are many scholars who uh, posit and who say that reading literatures can make human beings more empathetic. So, if one reads about diverse cultures, if one reads about diverse situations, which may not be familiar to us, the idea is one would become more empathetic. So that is the question that I'm, look, I'm, I'm examining in this project. Can literatures, can reading literatures, can that make us more empathetic? I mean, the answer is like yes and no. Uh, no, because not all literatures make us empathetic. But it is yes, because there are some literatures that are more suited for cultivating empathy. And we will look at like, like my, uh, this, this project, this talk is about like, what are, if, if there are literatures that can generate empathy then what are those literatures? Can we uh, identify any particular genre or type of work that is more suited for uh, bringing different people together? So, uh, so empathy, as you can imagine, is 
a topic that has recently uh, attracted the attention of literary scholars and theorists. But it has been a subject of study in psychology for quite some time now. And uh, many scholars in psychology often use empathy as a criteria for understanding how humans behave in society. So this is a classification that you can see right in front of you on your screens uh, that like scholars have used this as a model to study human behavior. So uh, they have proposed that humans, like there are like roughly, if you look at, if you try to identify how humans behave in society there, you can do so in like two ways. Uh, there are two kinds of identities in that sense, identity categories that humans can align with. One is categorical identity and the other is empathetic identity. And these two are like opposites. So if an individual uh, aligns with categorical identity, then the individual would define themselves in relation to a particular group, a particular in-group, a particular cultural group. And this group can be anything. This group can be a national identity. This group can be a racial identity. It could be a religious identity. It could be a caste identity or a gender identity or a sexual identity or a social status, right? So uh, humans, are naturally conditioned to think categorically, think according to a categorical identity, because we, we are raised to be more empathetic to people who are familiar to us, the people who are who we see every day, right? And those people are usually a part of our own in-group. Uh, those, those are people who share our language, who share our customs, who share our traditions. So we are trained naturally to think categorically. Uh, and I mean, categorical thinking categorically is fine, but when it's taken to an extreme, it can uh, cultivate harmful feelings towards those who do not belong to our particular groups of familiarities. So thinking like taken to an extreme, thinking categorically can result to perceiving outsiders, those who do not belong to our particular national group, <laughs> racial group, religious group, uh, we can, uh, th that can like encourage thinking of outsiders as enemies or threats. So that is categorical identification. As opposed to that, empathetic identification is when individuals break down categorical boundaries to reach across borders. That is when individuals identify empathetically. So that is the other category. But unfortunately, empathetic identifications do not come as naturally as categorical identifications do. Empathetic, we don't naturally empathize with outsiders or people who we perceive as strange and like having strange languages or strange customs or uh, ways of life that are not familiar to us. So we, it's, it's not natural for humans to empathize with those who are outsiders in that sense. So scholars have suggested that, I mean, it's possible to cultivate empathetic identity, but, but that is, one has, but, but that is possible only through training, only by imagining familiarity with strangers and that requires practice. So how does literature come into this equation? Usually many scholars have said that literatures often allow the cultivation of that practice, right? 
like uh, scholars have found literatures to be a training school for empathy because it, when when you read literatures, you the idea is you try to uh, try to sit back and try to break your preconception the preconceived notions and understand what characters are thinking and imagining and that makes you empathetic right so uh oh wait okay so these are the two identity categories that are important to my study categorical identity and empathetic identity okay okay so we said uh, that scholars have believed that literatures, depending on what kind of literatures we read, are can help cultivate empathetic identifications. But then, I mean, uh, uh, we also said that there are like not all literatures are suited for empathy. And this is where the question of genre comes in. There are, uh, the, the hypothesis is that there are some genres in literature that are more suited for the development of categorical identifications. Whereas there, there are other genres in literature that are better for empathetic, cultivating empathetic identities. So of course, if the aim is to generate empathy for outsiders, I mean, one must know what are those works, what are those genres that help generate empathy for outsiders. So, for, I mean, of course, then we, it is also important to know what are those genres that mitigate or stop empathy. So the heroic plot, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i sure like a lot of the listeners here today, uh, like our students of literatures or like experts of literatures, and we have all encountered the heroic plot at some point or the other, right? So the heroic plot is often an important plot in thinking about literatures. And again, uh, Dr. Siddiqui pointed out that there are certain qualities in literature that are universal, right? So I would assume that the heroic plot is a structural quality in literature that one can find in different parts of the world, in literatures that are produced across the world, right? So, so heroic plot is sufficiently universal in that sense. And research suggests that the heroic plot is often more suited for categorical identification. Why? Because a heroic plot typically tracks the journey of a hero as they would overcome obstacles that are a threat to their own community, nation or tribe, right? And this threat that we are talking about, in a heroic plot, there is always a threat, right? This threat is often external. It is from outside the community, right? So the threat is, so though this external enemy, this foreign enemy is often uh, threatening the peace and the prosperity of the heroes in group, right? That is the threat. A heroic plot is often it, it often promotes an us versus them kind of a dynamic. So the us is people who are part of the hero's group, familiars or community members. 
the, the folks that the hero is responsible for protecting. And the them is often the enemy, the enemy that threatens the peace of the hero's world, right? Uh, and the members of outgroups, these enemies, these foreign threats, are often dehumanized in a heroic plot. Dehumanized in the sense that they are represented as terrible, capable of immense torture, and also sometimes capable of less pain than ordinary, right? So a heroic plot often celebrates the victory of the hero over the villain. So it celebrates the defeat of the villain. And the villain is often a foreigner. Now, again, like there is nothing wrong with the heroic plot, but taken to an extreme, it can be problematic if your aim is unity between diverse communities, diverse cultures, right? I mean, I mean, the range of works that has use the hero heroic form is very diverse, right? One can like Bollywood films is off, are often like films that choose the heroic narrative. Like, I mean, think about like a Salman Khan movie or, or an Akshay Kumar movie, right? And I mean, it's not just Bollywood, right? I mean, if you think about Hollywood, you have James Bond or Indiana Jones or the Avengers, right? These all follow the heroic genre in certain ways, right? And so uh, I'm, I'm just taking examples of films here, but like literatures do the same. They often like, if, if it's a thriller or some kind, they'll often be in the mold of a heroic plot where there is a quintessential hero saving his community from an external threat, right? And this, this threat is somebody who is like different, who is terrible in certain way and often less capable of fame. And when, when the hero, when Akshay Kumar or Salman Khan beats the villain and defeats the villain, it's, it's, it's not a cause of mourning, it's, it's a cause of celebration, right? And, and that's totally fine. But the problem is heroic plots have often been the preferred genre for works that have been seen as racist or xenophobic or all kinds of problematic, culturally problematic texts, like propagandas have often uh, opted for the heroic plot over any other plot. So like, so, so taken to an extreme, the heroic plot would cultivate categorical identity and that would incline you to empathize just with your own group and not with foreigners or outsiders. So if, if, heroic if, if the heroic genre or the heroic plot is a plot that favors categorical identification, is there a genre that favors empathy? I mean, research suggests, yes, there is, and it's the romantic plot. The romantic plot, like the heroic plot, is pretty universal. And I mean, again, it, there's like, um, again, uh, there is like a basic structure or like a basic like a recipe, which is adapted in different ways in different parts of the world, but it features some of the same things, right? Uh, why, and, 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 and the idea is the romantic plot is more suited for empathy. And, but, but why is that? And, and I feel that one of the reasons why a romantic plot favors, big, favors breaking down of cultural boundaries because uh, identity categories like class, caste, race, nation, ethnicity, family are often the obstacles to the union of lovers in a romantic plot. So the lovers often do not belong to the same in groups. 
they often come from different backgrounds. They often come from different communities, right? So a romantic plot structurally uh, inclines us as readers or as viewers to root for the union of the lovers and root for breaking down of the categorical boundaries that are obstacles to their unions, right? And the villains in a romantic plot are often different too. They're not the same, they're not the same as villains in a heroic plot. In a heroic plot, the villains are often foreigners, or, or it's, it's like, remember, Thanos, right? Thanos in the Avenger movies, right? That's the kind of prototypical villain in, in a heroic plot. But in a romantic plot, I mean, you would hardly find a Thanos or a Voldemort or a Mogambo as a villain in a romantic plot. I mean, romantic plot villains are, or antagonists are often family members or relatives or some important community member who, who doesn't want the union of these two lovers who belong to different groups, right? So the level of dehumanization, the level of uh, terribleness that defines the villain is way less intense in a romantic plot in compared to a heroic plot. So uh, they're not as terrible as Mugambo or a Voldemort, right? They're still capable of some feelings, right? They are of obviously against the union of the two lovers who are probably their family members, but they're still human beings who are part, who have good intentions for their family members, right? So that, that, that's different. And again, these are like broad structures, right? There is no exception. Like a romantic plot may be different in different cultures, but these are some structural features that you will find repetitions in many cultures, right? Okay, so again, like how does this all relate to Kashmir? I mean, uh, Kashmir, as we know, is one region of the world today that has experienced conflict, right? Like immense conflict, like the death toll has been, like if you look at the death toll in the past 40, 50 years, and this is like, I looked at some polls, it's, it's like in the thousands, like, right? Uh, there are many locations in Kashmir where like kidnapping and rape happen at a daily rate, right? And like Kashmir, Srinagar and other spots, the, like normal life is something that is a thing of the past, right? Even if like the violence is not visceral, it is still something that exists like a dull reminder, right? And that dull reminder is lockdowns. We know something about lockdowns now in a pandemic, right? Imagine like having to live in a lockdown for years without any end, right? Uh, it, like, um, and because of lockdowns, because of all these curfews, uh, there is uh, many important things that we often take granted in our lives, like healthcare, education, trade, mobility. Uh, they're all like halted. It's like, uh, so Kashmiris, just the basic access to a hospital or to a school has become something of a challenge. Right and 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 the, and and the situation in Kashmir has been debilitating, right? And like the question is like who is responsible for this? Like I mean like there is one side of the story that would say that India and Indian military or Indian government is the main villain, uh, 
Uh, there is another side of the story that would say Pakistan, because Kashmir is a region that has that has like India and Pakistan has like fought over the region for a very long time, right? Like India has moral claims that like Kashmir needs to be in within the borders of India, at least two thirds of it is in India, right? Uh, and Pakistan wants Kashmir for themselves, right? So, so there are moral claims on both sides, right? So what kind of stories are we used to about Kashmir? That is the question. Do we have stories that really empathize with the people of Kashmir? Or are, the, are these stories like catering to some, to some propagandistic representation of what's happening in Kashmir with the aim of like siding, right? Like taking sides, like either one side or the other, right? So can we, so is, do, do, do we see like, uh, like our, do, can we identify literatures or repre literary representations of Kashmir that are truly empathetic? That is the question. And that is something that I'm interested in in my project. Now, there are two kinds of representations and these are like, I mean, most of these images that you see are from India, but there is one like Azadi, which you see, that's a, a film from Pakistan. So, I mean, these are, popular representations of Kashmir. And they often, and they often go for the heroic model in representing the story of Kashmir. There is often an us versus them dynamics, right? And this us versus them can be many things. This can be Kashmiris and non-Kashmiris. This can be Hindus and Muslims. This can be uh, India and Pakistan, right? So often a majority, I'm not saying all of them, a majority of pop cultural representations, which would include films, media stories, songs, often cater to an us versus them narrative, right? Where depending on what side they're coming from, you either get India, as the villain or you get Pakistan as the villain, either you get like Hindus as demonized or Muslims as demonized, Kashmiris as demonized. There is a lot of demonization, right? And there is the hero narrative where there's one hero who would be able to do something which would of course involve violence to like bring back peace to the conflicted region, right? And I have noticed that, I mean, while many of these films are good to a certain extent, some of them are, some of them are not, uh, there's often a bias which forbids them to really look at what is happening in the region. Like not just what is happening to one group, not just what is happening to Muslims, or not just what is happening to Hindus in, in Kashmir, but what is happening to the diverse populations that come from the region. How are their lives being affected without the coloring of communal uh, attitudes, right? Is, are there works that do that? Uh, and that is, and this is like an in uh, that that is this is an uh, work in progress for me, and I'm looking at a range of works. I, I, I my my uh, so far I have found out that literatures, which are less popular than films, are do better in terms of representing the issues more equitably in Kashmir, more equitably and with more objectivity. And in that account, I've looked at a range of different people, right? Mirza Wahid, who I'm going to talk about momentarily is one of them. I've looked at uh, uh, Aga Shahid Ali and his poems and his uh, representations of 
uh, Kashmir. I've looked at Salman Rushdie. I've, I've, I've looked a little bit at Arundhati Roy, but I'm, uh, and uh, there are a few others that who talk about Kashmir centrally, and I'm look at, and and that's an and that's a work in progress in that sense. And some of these literary works I have found out have done better in terms of uh, representing with empathy. And what are those things like? One thing that I found is like literatures often gravitate more towards the romantic genre rather than the heroic model, right? I mean, that doesn't really, I mean, I do want to clarify that like the heroic model doesn't, it doesn't mean that uh, by romantic and heroic, I'm not saying that romance could not, cannot be a part of the heroic model. I mean, of course, if there is a hero, the like a subplot is that the hero has a love affair, uh, has a interest, a romantic interest. And But the thing is, in a heroic model, often the hero has to sacrifice that love for the larger community, the nation, the cause, right? That is not so much in a romantic plot, right? Where the romance is the prime motive, right? And, and again, that is why uh, many of these works, literary works have gravitated more towards the romantic genre in representing Kashmir. I mean, some of them have looked at the heroic model, but they have done so in ironic and critical ways. And the Book of Gold Leaves is one example that not only gravitates towards the romantic model, but it also, I mean, when it looks at the heroic model, it does so in an ironic way. And we'll see, we'll, we'll see how. Okay. Uh, okay, so the Book of Gold Leaves is a historical romance written by, uh, wait, just a second. is a historical romance written by Mirza Wahid. Uh, it was written in 2016. And Mirza Wahid is himself a Kashmiri. And right now he lives in England, but he spent most of his like youth till adulthood in Srinagar. And uh, he lived through the late 80s. He was in Kashmir during the late 80s and the 90s when the insurgency really began in Kashmir. And when, when, when a lot of things were happening in the region. So many of his fictions, now he has written three books. The Book of Gold Leaf, Leaf is a second one. Uh, is this, and, and all his novels and like fictions are about Kashmir during this late 80s, early 90s period. Uh, the Book of Gold Leaves is a romance. So the conflict of Kashmir is presented through the perspective of the lovers, Fez and Ruhi, who come from prominent families, in uh, Muslim families in uh, Srinagar. I mean, the, uh, and, and of course, like while they both are Muslim, they, the, one is from the Shia sect and one is from the Sunni sect. So again, there are like obstacles to their union. The obstacles are not just these social ethnic barriers, but it's also the conflict, right? So again, like what, so, I mean, if you look at typical, if you look at typical uh, uh, popular narratives about Kashmir, 
there is often a tendency to demonize just one side. And that could, I mean, depending on which side it is, it could be like, of course, Indian army, or it could be militants or whatever, right? Well, so, so like a propagandistic narrative would typically like highlight the atrocities and often like exaggerate one side and mitigate what is happening on the other side. So this book, and, 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 and one reason why I found this book a little more objective, though, of course, this does have some problems. Uh, this uh, e even like representations of Wahids are not, uh, uh, of this novel is not perfect, but what it does, what brings some more seriousness, objectivity to this novel is it presents different sides to the atrocities. So the novel does focus a lot on the atrocities happening in Kashmir because of the Indian army. And like, there are many moments where one can see that. And these are some quotes that I've selected from the novel that gives a sense of like, uh, how day-to-day -day life is disrupted by the interventions of the Indian army who often work and like with, who often brutalize with impunity in the region. And the novel does bring that to attention. But then again, the novel does not really spare the militants and shows that like, I mean, of course, the Indian army plays a significant role in contributing to the pain of the region but the militants who often cross the borders from Pakistan are also responsible for, for inflicting pain on the people of Kashmir. In, in fact, it is usually because of the confrontations between the Indian army and the militants that there's a lot of collateral damage and that collateral damage is Kashmiris themselves. Another thing that I feel is often, it, it's, it's often a contentious topic in popular narratives of, uh, about Kashmir is representation of the minorities. Now, I mean, of course, uh, in Kashmir, Hindus are the minorities because it's a Muslim majority region, right? So, I mean, depending on what narrative you see and which kind of narrative you are looking at, minorities, the role of minorities in the region is either diminished or overlooked, or it is exaggerated, right? In some narratives about uh, Kashmir, you only get a Hindu perspective. Whereas in other narratives that uh, you, you, there is a wiping over of what happened to Kashmiri pundits, right? This novel, even though it takes a predominantly Muslim perspective, is not does not swipe the plight of Kashmiri uh, pundits under the carpet. There are uh, characters, prominent characters who are Kashmiri pundits in the novel. And the novel does give you a trajectory of how gradually during the 80s, uh, Kashmiri pundits were driven out of the region because of the larger violence in, in Kashmir, right? Gradually one by one, some of them are killed most of them are exiled, right? So whereas ones that they were in the thousands of numbers and gradually that those thousands become a few hundreds, right? And this novel kind of beautifully traces those years and the dwindling number of Kashmiri pundits in the region. So again, it kind of gives you a 
a vision of the region without really catering or pandering to a particular side. So, I mean, again, it, this is a romantic narrative, but there are certain heroic, uh, there are certain features of heroism and that we see through the character of Fez, who's the main protagonist. Or if, if there's a hero in, in this novel, it is Fez. So Fez is, again, there are two kinds, two phases in which uh, the character of Fez is developed. One is before radicalization and the other is after radicalization. Now, now at the beginning, Fez is introduced as a poet, somebody who has pretty much nothing to do with politics, but, he is unfortunately drawn into the middle of the conflict when his godmother gets killed in a crossfire between, in, in a crossfire by, initiated by the Indian army. And that kind of shakes the worldview of Fez and he's launched into this cycle of revenge, right? Where, where he experiences radicalization, where he leaves, he gets disinterested in everything that he was interested in before. And then he gets launches into a trajectory of the typical hero who has to go on a pilgrimage, which is again, his road to radicalization. So he goes to a militant camp in Afghanistan to get trained to come back and do something, take revenge on the Indian army, right? This is the kind of heroic plot that we witness. But the question then is, like, does this novel then end like a typical heroic novel, the victory of the hero over the villain? The villain, of course, here is uh, the Indian army in that sense, in, in, in Fez's narrative, not, not the whole narrative. So I'm just uh, like, in this case, I'm just talking about Fez's story. Okay, love stories. Again, as I said, the novel is primarily a love story. And it is a love story between Ruhi and Fez. And, but there is a thing about time in the novel because the novel keeps oscillating between the present, which is the time of conflict, and the past, which was a time of peace. So in that sense, the novel explores two love stories, one between Ruhi and Fez, which is happening in the presence, in the time of crisis, and the other, happening between Shanta Kaul and Afad Bukhari. Uh, who, and that happened in the past, a past when there was peace and relative peace in Kashmir, right? Now, this is what happens though. Like as you follow the love story, the romance between Fez, it is developing. There are family tensions between Fez's and Ruhi's family. But ultimately what happens that all those tensions get resolved, mainly because both the families realize that there are larger threats in the region. And the only way for a community to survive is when you resolve your own differences. Unity is often better when you are facing a crisis, right? So the conflict is incentivizes unity for the families of Ruhi and Fez who were originally opposed to their union, but because of the unfolding situation in the region, they finally give in and, and this like historic union between a Shia boy and a Sunni girl happens, which is like, it's not a matter of like, it, it's not a small matter, right? However, what happened to the love story between Shanta and Afak? 
Kashmir, during the time of peace, there was no in incentive for un unity there. So Shanta being a Kashmiri pundit and Afak being a Muslim, I mean, they were in love, but their family never agreed. And as a result, their union never happened because, I mean, it was the time of peace and there was no incentive, larger social incentive for them to come together. Okay, so this is my last slide. And my question is, is this narrative heroic or romantic? What I found out that categorizations are never easy, right? So this novel particularly borrows from both the tradition, but is neither. But it does, and because of that, it does end up producing, generating empathy, right? Now, why is it not a heroic narrative? I mean, let's, uh, going back to Fez's story, right? I mean, Fez, is, Fez gets, gets launched into the heroic journey and he is following the route of a typical hero. Right, but ultimately, when he is about, when the revenge prospect of revenge becomes palpable, when he is about to go ahead and launch an attack on the Indian army, he does. Re he sees his. He sees Ruhi. He sees his own family, and he realizes that. What is more important? Is becoming a martyr for this cause, is nationalism more important? Or is the safety and unity of the community more important? Because he may be successful in his revenge project. Of course, he would lose his life, but will that, but if he law carries out that attack, that would definitely have an impact on his community, on his family members. So thinking and so imagining those scenarios, he ultimately chooses his family, his partnership with Ruhi over being a martyr. So, I mean, the story gives up and rejects the heroic at the final moment. Then is this a romantic narrative? I mean, it is, but again, it does not follow through till the end as a romantic genre because half as a romantic plot because about halfway through the plot, the romance is resolved. It's not like a Romeo and Juliet where the romance ultimately kills the lovers, right? I mean, Midway, Fez and Ruhi's family agree that unity is more important and their union is fixed. They get married, right? So all those romantic obstacles are overcome, right? And the suggestion is that, of course, when there is a conflict in the region that is killing thousands of people, I mean, all the romance needs to be resolved unity needs to happen and a community focus should be on how to socially resolve the problem, right? Okay, so going back to the question and this is where I'll end, uh, is can literatures generate empathy? My answer is yes, again, and I'm looking into, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm reading more literatures and like trying to expand this project. And it often depends on what kind of literature is one reading, right? As, as I said, like there are some literatures that enhance categorical identifications and there are some literatures that cultivate empathy. But here's the important thing that I'll leave this, I'll end this talk with. Scholars have, 
also said that there is no one particular literary work or literary genre that cultivates empathy. They have said that empathy can be cultivated when one reads widely, not just literatures that are produced, that, that produce their own convictions and points of views, but literatures that come from diverse locations, diverse culture, that represent diverse cultural ideas. Only when you read widely, read diversely, can you develop an appreciation and empathy for others who may hold very different views, who may have very different ways of life, who may come from very different backgrounds, but you may be able to create those bridges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anad Dutta Roy. What a wonderful lecture and what an extended talk on empathy. In a world which is divided on caste and creed and religion, gender, so many different issues, I believe that empathy is the only aphrodisiac. So wonderful, wonderful lecture, Anad. Thank you. Uh, I saw that Professor Asim Siddiqui was listening to your lecture very keenly throughout. Sir, would you want to make any observations on Dr. Anab's lecture? All right. Uh, then perhaps we'll move to the questions. Uh, we have one question from Ms. Archal Yadav. Mm -hmm. So it is here. Professor Siddiqui, I just mentioned your name. I thought you were listening to Arnav's lecture very keenly. So would you want to make an observation on that? I think you may need to unmute the... Mr. Mishra, Dr. Mishra, please uh, make Professor Ashim Siddiqui the co-host. So just a second. No, I can, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, I just listened to this lecture uh, with rapt attention. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't read this work of Mirza Vahid. I have read his uh, other work, which came out last year. Uh, but... Uh, oh, we, oh, nice. He, he did, like, write something last year. I've read his first one, which was <laughs> The Collaborator. Yeah. yeah, yeah. last year, something to tell you. Uh, that, that was... Uh, Something yeah, yeah, that, 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 that is probably the one. I've not read the latest one. And uh, I particularly like the style of that work because uh, he experimented, especially in that work. But yes, I mean, uh, this work was a kind of revelation and uh, good to see that Mirza Vahid uh, can offer multiple perspectives. So that kind of complexity. And of course, uh, uh, actually, I was reminded of uh, my teacher, uh, Professor Mahbul Hassan Khan. He used to talk about this uh, concept of empathy a great deal. And uh, he used to discuss in a different context that if you are a student of literature and uh, any book that you are reading, just uh, bring that sense of empathy to any book or any author. Uh, and probably that is a kind of prerequisite to appreciate literature. Uh, so I can just congratulate him I mean, uh, for this uh, brilliant presentation. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, sir. Moving further ahead, Dr. Arnab, as I said, there's one question by an undergraduate student at our college, Achal Yadav. Her question is, why is emotional empathy important? Is empathy an emotional response? How does empathy change an individual? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I, yes, I think it is an emotional response. And uh, I mean, the whole point about empathy is that it is, it is a response. So, uh, I mean, unguarded, it can like generate like empathy for like in groups or out groups, those who are close to us. I mean, we feel for people who think like us also because of empathy. But when we are like looking at outsiders and if we can develop that connection with the outsider, that is also empathy. But the question here is, 
what kind of empathy is productive? Of course, those we know, we naturally share a connection. I mean, we eat, often eat the same kind of food. We discuss the same kind of stuff. We have shared the same kind of habits. And like for us to understand our near and dear is natural. But imagine those who do not share our customs Imagine those who do not share our traditions or cultural views or backgrounds, like how do we empathize with them, right? And that is something that needs training that doesn't happen automatically. And that training can happen through literatures as many have believed, right? Like uh, you have to read and not just read any work, you have to read like diversely. So that, 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 that responds, that empathetic response to outsiders can allow you to think beyond your own groups. And in that sense, it's a very, it is an emotional response, but again, when it is trained and if it is trained, it can be socially directed for good. Like I'm gonna give you a quick example a non-literature example. So, uh, I mean, you, we all know that in a hospital, there are emergency units, right? And in an emergency unit, there are nurses and doctors who have, who witness uh, like injuries, right? Death at a very regular basis. So there's like accident patients, or like there are patients who are almost like passing away. So, I mean, the immediate response, like when you see those, that, that, that can have a very intense reaction, emotional reaction, right? And if you are not trained, you can, your systems can shut down, right? But that is why nurses and doctors often go through what is called an empathy training session so that they can witness all these intense moments and yet be productive so that they can help out these patients, right? So that is an ex ex example of empathy training that happens outside literatures. So scholars believe that the same empathy training that these nurses and doctors often get can often be produced when reading literatures have done right, right? So that you do not like turn away from a tough situation, but you train your emotions in a way that you can be helpful to society, right? So yes, it is an emotional reaction but it is not something that is spontaneous. I mean, it can be a spontaneous reaction, but it is something that needs to be cultivated effortfully so that it can be of some social good. Thank you so much, Anup. You have explained it very well. Now I would summarize Dr. Anup Datta Roy's lecture. In his lecture, Dr. Anup has extensively talked about Mirza Wahid's The Book of Gold Leaves, which is a modern romance set in the backdrop of occupied park, occupied Kashmir. He further adds um, how the novel explores the Kashmir conflict from the perspective of a local couple, Fares and Ruhi, as they negotiate their romantic union through obstacles, including communal strife, their own ideological positions on Kashmir, and the broader political turmoil in the valley. Dr. Arnav's study facilitates fresh ways of exploring empathy and literature and provides insights into understanding the Kashmir conflict. Finally, he also gives us a piece of advice and he says that empathy can be cultivated by reading widely. So this is a point for all of us to remember. Moving further ahead to our last speaker, last but not the least, Dr. Chuyun O oh from USA. Dr. Chuyun, I hope you have joined in. We have heard a lot about you from Dr. Fatima Nuri, 
perhaps Nuri and Chuyun were there in the other states together. This is what I gather from the conversation. So we are very excited to hear your lecture. Dr. Nuri will now introduce you to the attendees. Okay. Um, so uh, before I uh, introduce Dr. Chuyun O formally, I just uh, uh, wanted to make an observation about Arnav's talk. Uh, it was a very uh, well elaborated and uh, 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 we really enjoyed and I'm pretty sure our students would have gained a lot from this talk. Uh, this one just small observation. I was looking forward to a little more diverse narratives, mostly because you talk about it. So I was thinking you would be talking about people from the uh, uh, writers of uh, the uh, Kashmiri Pandits, uh, Siddharth Gigu and uh, uh, Rahul Pandit, and you, because you mentioned uh, Mirza Wahid and all those people. So it, perhaps in your le next lecture, I would like to uh, uh, address that, those angles as well, the, because uh, this is Daag Dehelvi Sher, uh, which goes as Hum Dekhne Walon Ki Nazar Dekhte Hain. So I think we uh, critical uh, people who uh, enter into critical analysis and stuff, we should have a more uh, diverse ideas about it. Otherwise, I think it was a wonderful talk. Uh, so good to see you and uh, hear you out. Uh, moving on. Uh, yeah, thank uh, you so much. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. With us today is Dr. Chuyun O, oh, an assistant professor of dance at the San Diego State University. Dr. O's field of study would be interesting to the students and colleagues as an area of focus is on performance ethnography and the construction of racial and gender identities in Korean pop dance. She was a Fulbright scholar from South Korea to the US at the University of Texas uh, at Austin, Texas. And she earned her PhD in the performance studies. It was uh, called the K-Popscape Gender Fluidity and Racial Hybridity in Transnational Korean Pop Dance. Dr. O oh has about 45 research papers or maybe more uh, articles published in peer and non-peer reviewed journals and conference proceedings. Her work has appeared in dance research journals, the Journal of Popular Culture, Communication, Culture and Critique, the International Journal of the History of Sport, the Journal of Fandom Studies and Dance Chronicle. She's an international award-winning dancer and has performed across Japan, Germany, South Korea, Austria and the US. Since 2016, her works have been selected as top contributed performances thrice in the performance studies division at National Communication Association in the US. She serves on the editorial board at the National uh, of uh, Text in Performance Quarterly and Review of Communication. Before her position at San Diego State University, Dr. Chuyun O oh taught at the Hamilton College in New York, uh, where I met her, and at the University of Texas, Austin. In 2015, Dr. Chuyun was a frequent visitor to the two Indian restaurants that were near uh, the Hamilton College as she loves spicy Indian curry. Over to you, Dr. Chuyun. Thank you very much, Dr. Fatima Nuri for the wonderful introduction. So let me go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> Can you see my screen and sound my voice? Uh, yes, you're very clear. Okay. So today my talk is titled K-pop dance fandom and it is based on my current book project. So before I get started, um, so I was a professional dancer and performing for many years and my experience as a dancer on stage taught me that we are not just performing a role on stage, but we are actually performing identities on daily life. So my research has been covered by media, um, especially my research's emphasis on 
K-pop. And I think K-pop is an interesting and quite important case studies for many people in humanities. Um, first of all, because of its transnational adaptation and also transnational circulation. You are singing BTS, one of the most well-known K-pop groups, and CNN reported two years ago saying that K-pop is one of the biggest transnational phenomenon after hip hop. So what it teaches us as an academic is that how K-pop resonates with the long history of <clears throat> quote unquote, eating the other. I am citing from critical scholar bell hooks and how the racial and ethnic minorities culture in the West could be used as a spice that sort of um, add more flavor to dull white dishes in Western culture. But on the other hand, how we can understand this example as a sign of more diverse, more open-ended and more active ways of um, consuming and also exchanging culture. Because many scholars have now argued that maybe K-pop signifies quote unquote invasion of Asian culture because of its huge visibility. So today I'm gonna focus on actually not K-pop singers or performances, but K-pop fandom, because I think what makes K-pop interesting to me as a scholar is the K-pop fans physical and affective investment in K-pop fandom. So let me explain K-pop briefly, just in case you're not familiar with it. So K-pop started in South Korea around early 1990s, and there have been vernacular and also traditional and popular music form in South Korea. But K-pop became popular as a form of idol performance that is highly dance-centric. Also, what makes K-pop interesting is the, its hybridity. So what I mean by hybridity, which I elaborated in my dissertation is first of all, linguistic hybridity, because many K-pop singers are not Korean, although they look like K-pop idols, but their race, ethnicity, and citizenship becomes more and more diverse. And they have been trained to speak multiple languages such as Japanese, English, and Chinese, so that they can appeal a wider range of audiences. As you can see, their racial and ethnic features sometimes look ambiguous on purpose, again, so that they can appeal a broader range of audiences. And I think it also speaks to the general features of social media, such as social media influencers or dance influencers who increasingly have um, racially and ethnically, ethnically ambiguous facial features. Another thing I want to draw your attention to is the um, gender hybridity or gender ambiguity. So it's a photo of K-pop male idol and there's a term called the flower boys because they are as pretty as flower. But at the same time, um, the gender performativity is not limited to um, like a beautiful, sophisticated male prototype in K-pop. There's also a term called the beast idol who are more interested in promoting sexy, tough, and traditionally manly masculinity. So now I'm moving into K-pop fandom. So K-pop would not be possible especially in terms of its global reach without social media. So it was YouTube until recently, and I think the trend is moving toward TikTok, which is one of the um, most popular app in the United States. And TikTok started from China, and there has been a little bit of political issue, especially under the Trump administration. But I think the TikTok's visibility is noticeable, especially during COVID-19, because more and more people, let's say, for example, in the United States, got into creating hashtag dance challenge video to cope with their anxiety through dance. So what makes K-pop fandom unique is that they are not 
just a passive, um, for the lack of a better word, passive consumer of music. Although listening to music is not a passive consumption, but it doesn't necessarily require embodied effort or labor. But K-pop fans are active producers using their bodies. For example, Flash Mob, um, so because I'm in San Diego, there is a San Diego K-pop Flash Mob dance group. So Flash Mob could be an example. And there's also a trend that is popular on YouTube called K-pop Random Dance Challenge. So what they do is that they play K-pop music in a public space, and then they see if they can um, recall and then do the um, iconic dance routine as soon as they hear K-pop songs. K-pop cover dance festival has been across the world and it is especially sponsored by Korean government. So I think it has another layer how the Korean government is promoting um, K-pop as a symbol of national culture. So I think um, it, it, it may be extended to the discussion of tourism. I think K-pop fans in particular is almost signaling the new era of digitalization, democratization, and participatory culture in the era of social media. So Stizzy is a dance studio located in LA, in California, and they, are, um, they have one of the most popular apps where you can basically learn dance. So it's like a yoga app, but it's a dance app. And they start providing K-pop dance class taught by Ellen and Brian. So they are YouTube semi-celebrities. They are Chinese American and they got their fame and popularity by offering K-pop dance tutorial videos. As I briefly mentioned, um, as you already know, TikTok is designed to post very short videos. And K-pop is one of the widely performed style on TikTok. And I think it speaks to how the face and appearance driven social media culture sort of matches with K-pop aesthetics that highlights the visuality and also dance centric nature of performance. Another thing that I want to draw your attention to is that K-pop illuminates a moment um, in contemporary society where the fandom in social media can actually turn into professional career. Last year, Dance Magazine, which is one of the most uh, one of the most respected magazine in the field of dance in the United States, released an article about K-pop fan who started their dance training as a K-pop fan, but later contributed to BTS's choreography. So she switched her career from K-pop fan to social media celebrity and also choreographer. Another example could be Lallari. So they consist of multi-ethnic and racial dancers, and they released their own single album, digital single album, two years ago. And when I attended KCON, KCON is one of the biggest K-pop concert and also Korean culture festival in North America and also some part of the world. They were invited as a, um, like, an, like an artist in addition to the main concert. So the ways they made the money to release their digital single is from Kickstarter. So again, it reminds us the potential of social media and also the crowdfunding and how amateur artists and also fans could build their career building a social media fandom. Um, before I'm introducing one of my case study, which will be included in my current book project, is that I just want to reiterate that um, the democratization of dance and arts education in social media, because, for example, many of the K-pop dancers are amateur dancers and 
Um, sometimes they are quite young, but they have no issues as long as they have the internet to learn K-pop dance because on YouTube, there's a lot of K-pop tutorial video, fitness exercise, and even um, official music agent released the mural version of choreography for their fans. So this is a photo of a case study that I wanna introduce you today. So they are K-pop cover dance group in San Diego. What I mean by K-pop cover dance is that it is a fan practice. It refers to a fan made music video that replicates the original music video choreography, including makeup, fashion, dance movement, and sometimes even performing persona because music video involves with facial acting, facial expression and lip syncing, lip singing. So they are sort of producing an imitated version of the original choreography, but K-pop cover dance is much more than a simple imitation, which I will um, elaborate a little bit more. So the dance group is named Chaotic, and they introduced themselves. They are one of the biggest K-pop dance team and also dance team in their universities. And it is a home for the K-pop fans in the, in the university. And they are inclusive, which means anyone can join the dance team regardless of their dance skills, background, and also racial, gender, ethnic identification. So I'm going to play a, an example of K-pop cover dance. So the original is um, one of the most well-known K-pop girl group, Blackpinks, and their um, Kill This Love. And then that's the photo of their K-pop cover dance. I will play the original really quick and then move on to the cover dance version. So this is the original music video. And if possible, I want you to focus on the similarities. So I will play the iconic choreography section on me, and that's the cover dance version. So the video was filmed in Balboa Park in San Diego and they are all university students uh, and the university they are attending is one of the most prestigious um, university across the nation in the United States. And they are majoring in engineering and also humanities and they are pursuing their career perhaps in other field after graduate. But K-pop is um, sometimes even more than unhappy because they can build a sense of community and also express themselves. Many of the dancers have been trained in dance um, and also sometimes martial arts, ballet, and modern dance in many different types of dance styles. As you can see, um, they are Asian and their ethnicities include Vietnamese American and Chinese American. So because of their Asianness, sometimes it's kind of easy to pass or to look like a K-pop idols. So one of my publication focused on the dance team and delineated the process of identity passing because in Western scholarship, identity passing has been focusing on the black and white racial paradigm, such as how white artists are passing to black or how black is passing to white. But there's not many scholarly discussion about how ethnic minorities in the United States, for example, are passing to another ethnic minorities.
I just want to share some of the um, stories based on my ethnographic interview. So one of the dancers told me that we do not discriminate against age, gender, race, skill, or anything. And our dance team takes everyone. The personal goal is to make K-pop fans something that everyone can feel comfortable liking or feel comfortable being a fan of. I think many people do not look like they could like K-pop, but the point is that K-pop transcend language and culture barriers. So, um, what the dancer is pointing to is the possibility of using performance as a transnational language. And given that the dance team um, has a lot of ethnic, racial, and sexual minority students, it is possible that um, those young college dancers are using K-pop as a platform to build a sense of community. And we might want to remind ourselves that there's not many positive representation of Asian in Western culture, other than quite stereotypical side characters in the mainstream culture. So there's a clearly a sense of pan-Asian identity and pan-ethnic identity and how these dancers are utilizing K-pop to enhance the sense of community. However, at the same time, during my ethnography interview, it is not just this particular team in the United States, there's not many Koreans or Korean Americans in K-pop cover dance team. So as a native Korean, I find it quite interesting because it adds another layer, including post-colonialism in the context of United States. So one of the interviewees said that many people ask us, are you guys Korean? Do you guys have a lot of Koreans? I'm like, no, we are just normal people. Our race or ethnicity doesn't really matter. And then um, the dancer said that we have a wide range of ethnic and racial um, dancers who identify with Asianness. So I think what it teaches us is that when we are considering the transnational circulation of performance, we not only need to look at the race and ethnicity, but also citizenship. Because in that case, the Asian American, although they are racially Asian, they are ethnically not Korean, but at the same time, they are, in terms of their citizenship, they are American. So there's a multiple layers of different power dynamics. Um, because today I'm mostly speaking to academics in India, I just want to bring up, um, as a concluding thoughts, the long history of um, intercultural adaptation and also cultural appropriation in dance. Ruth Saint Denis is called the one of the mother of or pioneer of American modern dance. And as you can see, she um, had dark skinned musicians so that her performance looks more authentic. And she painted her body so that her body looks darker. She's a white woman, but she got her fame and she established basically her career by performing Indian Godless. Um, like Bollywood or even yoga, they, there's a huge fascination on Asian culture. And to me, the transnational popularity of K-pop is signaling at least two things. One thing is, as I said, the idea of eating the other and how the Western culture and the mainstream audiences, including white consumers, are fascinated by the oriental exotic other and putting them on their white bodies. But at the same time, given that K-pop is not just beloved by white fans, but in many cases, even more predominantly racial and ethnic minority fans, including Latin American, African American, Asian American in the United States. So maybe we need to consider differently, the, especially the multiple layers in terms of the transnational circulation of performance. 
This is just another um, thing that I want to draw your attention to really quick at the end. One of the interviewees participated in my book project is refugee teens and K-pop cover dancer in Utica. So I met basically at, when I was a visiting assistant professor at Hamilton College. So in their community center that is serving refugees, um, most of the refugees comes from Southeast Asia, but they love dancing to K-pop and they perform K-pop cover dance. Um, so what I learned is that um, it is also important to consider the effective, genuine labor and love for dancing. And we know that empathy or love is socially constructed product, but at the same time, how we can value and address the physical bodily labor of K-pop dance fandom. Because when you're dancing, you cannot fake, you have to put the real effort and sweat in the dance floor. So um, I wanna argue that, which you will, will be able to get the full picture in my upcoming book is that K-pop fans are not just making a tribute to their K-pop cover dance video. I argue that they are fandoming themselves because when they are performing to the dance, they refashion their entire identities by reshaping their bodies from facial expression, makeup, costume, and the movement, and also the gesture, how they move, how they present themselves in certain persona. It's all a way, it, it is a way of um, rediscovering themselves and again, fandoming themselves through the adaptation of K-pop cover dance. Here's a reference that I relied on today and I'm happy to open up the floor for questions. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Am I audible? Dr. Chuyen, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. All right. So uh, thank you, Dr. Chuyen, for a very, very interesting lecture. And uh, I really half wish I could dance as well as your students were dancing there. Wonderful to watch. Uh, we have one question from a student here from Jagataran Girls Degree College. And uh, she wants to know that, she says here that as we all know that there is a band in the every dance background which makes the dancing more famous. Is there any band in K-pop dance? So what I believe she wants to ask is that is a band indispensable to a Korean pop dance or not? Is band a necessary part of Korean pop dance? This is uh, the question I, based. I see, what do you mean by band? Um, a group of people, a group of dancers dancing together. Oh. A large number of dancers dancing together, more than one. That is what she intends to ask. Oh, I mean the group dance. Yeah, group dance, absolutely. That's a great question. I think it comes from the idol culture because, um, and also when you are dancing, it's nice to have a backup dancers, but if you have like an idol group, that has, let's say, more than 10 dancers, you basically do not need backup dancers because the idols are already filling up the stage. So I think group dance is important because it enhances the, the um, it, it makes the power of dance more strong and also it has bigger impact. And I think for the fans perspective, when you're dancing together with their friends or peers, I think there's an instant sense of community and also like a harmony through the dancing moment and experience. Thank you so much. I hope your question is answered. There is another question by Sakshi, again from Jagataran Girls Degree College. Uh, her question is that what are the factors that make K-pop dance 
different from other dance forms what is the most important feature of k pop dance mm. um to me it is what they call point choreography it is usually situated in the chorus line of music video size gangnam style horse dance is an example of point choreography so k pop dance itself it takes a lot of influences a lot of different styles from many different dance traditions so it will be difficult to essentialize k-pop dance as its own style but at the same time i think it's even more important to look at the mechanism how it transnationally circulated intentionally taking inspirations and tradition and style from multiple dance cultures and then produce a style that is called K-pop. And I think it's a great question because nowadays we have K-pop groups who are not Korean. And also I assume that there will be K-pop groups created outside Korea. Then maybe it will be a question, what define K-pop dance as K-pop dance? Does it refer to Korean or does it refer to a production made in Korea? Because I think it already beyond that um, geography, um, defined definition. So I think it's important to us to think differently, especially with the social media. Thank you so much. I hope your question is answered, student. Um, there is another question by Kashi Shagarwal, University of Allahabad. She wants to know that what is the position of K-pop dance in India? Are there any followers of K-pop yes. dance yes. in India or do you have any idea? of any bands, any groups of K-pop dance in India? So unfortunately, my research area, I know it's kind of contradicting my own argument because social media is quite transnational, but the specific research areas I've been working on usually focus on Asian American population in the United States. So I actually do not have much information about fans in India, but the student, I think you can do a great job as the next generation of the scholar. I hope uh, we can follow uh, Madam Chuyun on uh, Facebook and other social media, and then perhaps we'll have a fan following in India also. I'm very sure about it. Oh, well, thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much for being here. Um, now we are drifting towards the finale of the webinar. We have been showered with so many variegated ideas from the Persian guzzle to the Korean dance form to empathy in novels that I feel that all of us have kind of gathered food for thought for many, many months to come. So thank you so much for everyone who was a part of this webinar. For a formal vote of thanks, may I call upon our very spirited, energetic, vibrant Dr. Fatima Nuri. Nuri, please, would you take over, please? Okay. Um, so. Uh... I think uh, uh, just uh, referring to the last bit uh, of uh, Chuyun's uh, question and answer session, uh, maybe Chuyun and I can take up a project where we study the fandom of uh, Korean pop dance in India. What say Chuyun? It sounds fascinating. And we can perhaps include Sakshi in there as well. Yeah. We can make a team of three and we can uh, Why study Why are you all fandom. leaving me out? For what specific reasons? Okay, you can come in too then. <laughs> uh, so the two-day international webinar on contemporary world literature and art forms organized by the Department of English, Jagataran Girls PG College, University of Allahabad hereby comes to a close. I would like to acknowledge the patronage, participation, effort, and help provided by the people in making this event successful. Foremost gratitude goes to our resource persons, Professor L.R. Sharma, former head of the Department of English, University of Allahabad, Professor Kian Peshkar, Islamic Azad University, Iran, Professor Asim Siddiqui of English Department, Aligarh Muslim University, Dr. Chuyun O oh from San Diego State University, California, Dr. Anavdatta Roy of University of Connecticut, USA, 
for taking out their valuable time and sharing their research with us and making this whole event so interesting. I thank our chairperson, Professor Asim Mukherjee for his kind words and encouragement and our principal, Professor Kamla Dube for her able guidance and support. This webinar would not have been conceived or carried through without the moral and logistical support of my colleague, Dr. Pratima Chetan. The inquisitive minds of the participants, students, researchers, faculty members from India and from abroad who remain connected with us via uh, YouTube, Telegram and WhatsApp is what makes this webinar a true success. I'm indebted to Dr. Ashish Mishra and Ms. Lalima Shirvasta for their help with the handling of the technological interface of the webinar. Students of Jagataran are always forthcoming with their support. Ananya Singh, Ayushi, Sunidhi and Nikita deserve a special kudos. A special, very special thank to my two babies, Zainab and Aditya for helping us out with the backstage details. We promise to be back again. Meanwhile, be well, do good, and keep in touch. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.